Mr. Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now today's video was not supposed to be. I did my video making piston rings and that was supposed to be the end of it. However, the way recent events have unfolded, I have ended up with the requirement to make a video piston rings to the sequel. Now, exactly why I require a video with such a title will become clear very soon. Before I start, however, I want to just address an issue. In that video, Making Piston Rings, there were a lot of comments, and about 50 of you commented on a similar theme. So to set the record straight, at 33 minutes into that video, no, I was not wearing pyjamas, and no, I did not have a nightcap made out of somebody's trouser leg. What I had was a genuine Victorian gentleman's nightshirt and cap, the kind that is available from your local gentleman's outfitter, country wear or otherwise. Well, with the serious topic out of the way, it's on to the content of this video. And basically, you're going to see how all this unfolds, but I'll start by saying this. The nice thing with these videos is I decide a topic, I put together the information I can find on that topic, and I present it and then people have the chance to comment and between us we often uh, come to new conclusions. Now such a new conclusion has been arrived in this video or should I say various conclusions and so you're going to see how all this unfolds. Now from the feedback I had and by the way I was very grateful for all that feedback by and large the machining methods were considered good but it would appear a few things in terms of piston ring design and material science I had a bit more work or a bit of learning to do. So you'll see exactly how this plays out. We'll kick off at the workbench and I will show you the rings as per the last video. We'll see if they go in the cylinder block and take it from there. So I made eight piston rings. That gives me four to use and four spare in case I have any mishaps while I'm trying to install them. And uh, having given these a bit of a polish up, the first thing I'm gonna do is just see, can I get a piston ring in the bore without any difficulties. If I can get the ring in the bore on its own then I know I stand a reasonable chance of putting the whole assembly together with the piston. But uh, let's see how this goes. I'm finding a spot on the cylinder that's fairly easy to deal with and I'm just going to see if I can squeeze this in. I don't think so. No, it appears to be butting up on the ends. If I show you that up close, the idea is that the rings come back together, but um, there's actually a slight hold off there. If you remember that I've broken these and the rings have basically snapped and the idea was that they sort of come back together and don't fully close up because you don't want them hard against each other but I think what they've actually done is these uh, surfaces have changed shape slightly perhaps during heat treat and they're doing this so they're not going in they're uh, colliding. So I'm just going to uh, have a little go at these with a needle file, I think. I'm just tickling up the inside faces here with a needle file. You can, of course, get a special device for doing this, sometimes called a gapper, and uh, something that anyone who's worked on full-size internal combustion engines will know all about. Uh, I'm doing this with a file, though, and just to be on the safe side and to counteract any errors in my filing, I am tipping the file slightly inward to bias the material removal towards the inside. That is because it is at the front of this gap where all the action happens. Most of this ring is buried within the piston. There is only a difference of a thou and a half between the piston OD and the bore OD. A thou and a half on the diameter means three quarters of a thou on the radius that's 19.05 microns, so there is only going to be three quarters of a thou of this gap visible. So it's all about the front edge. So now when the rings come together, 
makes a bit of a fine gap. Let's see what happens this time. There we are. Okay, so it's gone in, but it feels quite tight in there. I'm just going to get a piston to help me uh, keep it square. Okay, here's a piston, so this will allow it to go up and down the bore nice and square. And what I really want to do is examine this in the light and have a look for um, any errors in circularity. So I'm going to take this up to a window and then look all around the edges and see if I've got any gaps. Okay, looking out of the window, I'm going to present the bore to the light and examine it. Now you can see quite clearly the piston ring gap there. And I'm now looking all the way around the OD, looking for gaps. Now I can see an error there. Well that was about as much as my camera could cope with in terms of focusing, not to mention its operator, but to summarise what I basically found there was that although that gap is now okay and it's allowed the piston ring to go in the bore, I've got some errors in circularity. Now these are small errors, probably if I had to put a number on it, half to three quarters of a thou, but they are errors and the idea of the piston ring is to form a really good seal on the bore, so those errors are not ideal. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to remove the piston ring and examine its bedding pattern. Well, is it a boy or a girl? No, it's a piston ring. So let's have a look at the bedding pattern. And by bedding pattern I mean the uh, scuffing marks left from the two interacting components. So I can see that there has been some interaction either side of the gap, here to here and there has been some interaction from about here all the way around to here but disappointingly there has been very little interaction between here and here and here and here so basically with a symmetry line down the middle there's been reasonable contact about the bottom but the two sides have been rather um, on contacted and that pretty much corresponds with those light gaps that I could just about see and possibly you could see on the camera and that tells me that the ring isn't quite circular. Now of course um, you could argue this is more a test of how the bore matches the ring rather than a true test of circularity but I'm pretty happy with those bores I think it's much more likely that the rings are suspect. Now there is an argument here that these areas would wear in you know as the thing beds in that you would get better contact but these should really be better than they are uh, right off the bat so it's time for me to do a little bit of thinking so this has not gone to plan as you can see the gap was far too thick the OD is not round and this section is just too thick now the OD and the gap you could consider the minor defects but this too thick is producing a ring with a major defect and that is that it is just way too powerful. You saw how hard I had to try to get that in the bore and once it was in the bore that was very tight. That tight that that would cause premature wear. I think it would scrape all the oil out of the way and uh, basically this is one of those situations where you get to a certain point and you realize you've learned something. Now I have taken this away and done some thinking and I've done quite a bit of research aided greatly actually by all the comments left in the video making piston rings and if you are interested then I highly recommend you have a look through the comments in that video because there's a lot of expert opinions and a lot of people's experiences documented in there. Now one of the major um, revelations of this whole thing came from my friend Mike Sayers. I got in touch with him. Some of you may recognize the name Mike Sayers. He is the scale Bentley engine builder. I've shown him in my video um, Harrogate Model Engineering Show 2015 and he builds these scale Bentley engines and it's uh, high quality work to say the least. Now he sent me this document. Design and fabrication of piston rings. Now uh, this really is a golden nugget. I've never come across a document like it in model engineering 
and it's written by a man called George Trimble who was a NASA engineer and also a model engineer and over the course of his life he worked mainly on internal combustion engines and he put this document together and within it is all kinds of research and mechanics and basically he arrives at formulas and a method for making the perfect piston ring. Now I'm not going to attempt to sit here and uh, distill this all down and talk you through it. I am going to try and find a way to get this up online. So if anyone can talk me through, you know, the copyright, am I allowed to just publish this somewhere or can we find a version of it for the viewers? So if someone can tell me that, then I'll be happy to uh, try and get it to you all because it's well worth reading. It's 16 pages long and even if you aren't going to build any piston rings, it's just a great example of how engineering can be documented. Now, obviously... My first attempt at piston rings is looking a little on the questionable side, but I don't feel too bad because he sets out in the beginning here that he built his first piston ring in 1948 and he eventually reached at this conclusion in 1989. And uh, the 16 pages of this uh, method alone he spent 10 years researching. So, which is with this document and the comments in my YouTube video, that I'm now going to proceed with and come to some kind of conclusion. And the main question here is to start again or to rework. And normally in these scenarios I'm a big fan of just starting again. When there's something like this which has not had a lot of time invested, the tooling's all set up, I've still got spare material, I'm an advocate of just starting again because you can waste an awful lot of time trying to put things right when there's really uh, no need to just start again and it goes much better. In this scenario, however, I wouldn't just be starting again. I could start again 10 times and I'd get the same result 10 times because what's actually up here is a few parts of the method. Not so much the machining, but some of the mechanics, theory and uh, design. So what I would actually be doing is starting again in line with a totally different method. And this method is detailed such that I think there would be a learning curve attached to it and I could see myself starting again more than once all in pursuit of the perfect piston ring but what I'm actually going to do is use this opportunity to show another method that interested me and this was mentioned by about four or five people in the comments and that is that when they manufacture piston rings they actually finish machine the OD as the final op so the way I did it, the way this document has it, the way the large manufacturers do it, you machine the ring, then you process it, stretch it, heat treat, etc. It doesn't get machined again after its initial time through. But the method that these four or five people have mentioned they use is to actually do the finished machining as the final op. Now that takes a little bit of conceptualising, but I'm going to be showing it in the coming footage. So from here, this video is going to take two forms. I'm going to adapt that method that they use to make new rings, and I'm going to rework my existing rings. And once I've done that, then we'll have a look again at the finished ring, and I'll take you through a few of the little details in that document without glazing anyone's eyeballs. Now, um, the main thing here to tell you is that to reduce this thickness, I needed to work out how thick that ring should be. And that is one of the more simple elements of Trimble's work. And basically, you take the bore diameter and you divide it by between 25 and 30. So if you divide the bore diameter by 25, you get a slightly stiffer piston ring. If you divide it by 30, you get a slightly weaker piston ring. Now, I'm not going to mess around trying to find the optimum. I'm just going to aim for the middle. So I've taken the bore diameter and I have divided it by 27 and a half. And strangely enough, that gives me exactly half of what I ended up with the first time around. I did these an eighth wall thickness. If you take the bore diameter and divide it by 27 and a half, you get 62 and a half. So 125, an eighth, 62 and a half, a sixteenth. So I'm going to proceed. I'm going to machine these down. And I'm going to kick off by reworking the internal diameter. I have taken a piece of aluminium out of the scrap box. I have drilled and tapped four M4 holes in it and I'm going to make myself a little rework fixture.
Rework fixture finished and I'm now going to talk you through the following proceedings. Now I said on this piston ring that the gap, the ID and the OD all required some correction. However, it's only actually the ID and the OD that are going to get remachined. The gap is going to become right by the piston ring working at a slightly more expanded diameter than it was previously. So to put that into context, I have machined a bore in this piece of aluminium that is slightly, about 4,000.1 of a mil, bigger than the bore of the cylinder. So when I push this piston ring in, like that, I'm left with a gap that is of the working size. So this piston ring is now in its working position. All I have to do is address the OD and the ID. And to do that, I've got it pressed up against a shoulder in there, and I'm going to bring in four M4 flanged button head screws, and these are going to pinch the ring into the fixture. Now let me show you a little close-up of a few little design elements here. So you can see that the face of this aluminium has a slight step in it. And you can also see that the flange portion of the button head is positioned so it just catches the cast iron, but it also catches the raised portion of the aluminium. Now the important bit here is to say that the cast iron is actually sitting ever so slightly proud of this portion here and uh, that biases the clamping force of this onto the cast iron and pinches it nicely. So I can now machine the ID and to do that I've got a boring bar and why is it at such a ridiculous angle? Well by setting it up like this I can bore the ID out and I can then use these two portions of the sides of the insert and put my brake edges on. So this is a quick operation that requires no adjustment to the tool settings or any top slide work. So uh, here goes. finished internal diameter now and I will conclude this operation by doing a break edge either side a quick dust down with brother's toothbrush and I shall have the ring extracted. And there I have one thinned down ring. So the internal bore and the gap are now correct, but the external diameter is still not round. Now the question still remains, why did that external diameter end up being out of round? It was machined round, I then processed the rings, heat treated them, and the finished thing wasn't round. So how did that happen? Well, at the end of the video, I'm going to refer back to Trimble's work and I'm going to show you why they aren't round. But for now, I'm going to press on. I'm going to make them round. And to do this, I require some tooling. So I took a piece of two inch mild steel that already had a big hole in it from something I'd done in the past. I made myself a sleeve. I then proceeded with the rest of the material in the chuck to make this mandrel. And the final thing I'm going to do is I will rework this cap that you may recognise from the first piston rings video. Now to do this I'm going to hijack the mandrel and use it as a fixture. And I need to reduce the wall thickness of this cap. 
So I will do this and then you will see how all this comes together in the final couple of operations. The cap dimensions have been adjusted and I now have three little pieces of tooling. So let me show you what I'm going to do with them. On to the final proceedings and my explanation is going to kick off with a quick recap. So I machined this fixture in which there is a bore that is 4 thou or roughly 0.1 of a mil larger than the cylinder bore. By doing that, when I forced the ring in there, it gave me a more acceptable gap. So naturally, if the bore is slightly bigger, the gap is slightly bigger. And I made that bore such that I had an acceptable gap. And I then bored the ID, and that gave me the correct bore to gap relationship, leaving only one feature to go, which is the OD. Now, clearly this fixture restricts access to the OD, and uh, so something else is required. Now this something else goes as follows. I have made myself a sleeve that is again at that 4 thou oversized diameter. So when I now put the ring into this sleeve, which by the way has a little lead in taper, and uh, push it down with the piston, I have now created or recreated what will be the piston rings running position so you may have guessed what I'm going to do here I'm going to be um, loading in all the rings into this oversized sleeve and from here I'm going to clamp them in this oversized position and attempt to remachine the OD down to the bore size I'm reworking a total of five rings here and I had made the tooling such that I could take all five in one go. However, I have chickened out and I'm going to do uh, a maximum of three at a time. So what I've got here is this mandrel. I offer the sleeve with the expanded rings onto it, up against that back shoulder. And I then bring the cap in, which fits inside the sleeve and contacts the face of the... Uh, front ring in the stack and then in goes a cap screw and that should just squeeze those rings together and I'm going to do a few little checks <coughs> uh, this is all about the OD of the piston ring so with that in mind I have taken the relationship between the ID of the piston ring and the mandrel to a slight clearance fit such that I have some adjustability so off the bat here I've got an error of about 30 microns, 40 microns, that's just under a thou and a half, around a thou and a half. Okay, so uh, see if I can make this worse. Right, well we're nipped up and me and the indicator are calling it a draw. That's about um, 8 microns. So, the idea now is I remove the indicator temporarily and uh, this sleeve just comes off. Like that. And I'm now going to just check each ring in turn to make sure there's enough material there to clean up. So if you remember I left 4 thou on, that's 2 thou on the radius, so if I have any errors greater than 2 thou as I go around this, it's not going to clean up. So um, this is a fairly crucial check. About half a thou on that one. Okay, 
getting up towards three quarters of a thou. Probably about the same again. So the good news is uh, that is okay. One thing that has caught my eye is the size of these ring gaps. They have they're looking bigger than I was hoping. Not quite sure how they have got that big, but I'll press on with what I'm doing and consider that at the next stage. There has been a slight delay to service, but I'm back. I was just about to press go and I had a surprise visitation from the fish and chip van, so I've been spending my money again. I do believe, however, I was the first customer they've ever had who was wearing safety glasses. Now, what I've done here is I've taken the final step of blacking this up with a felt tip marker so that upon reaching the finished dimension I can check the entire OD has been cleaned up. So without further ado, I've got my round nose tool back in for a nice surface finish and I will see if I can turn these up. viewers may be interested to see uh, how clearly the areas in circularity can be seen um, with this little technique of blacking up. Those are errors probably less than three tenths of a thou now and you can quite clearly see what's going on. Okay I'm going to take this down very carefully half a thou at a time I don't want any surprises. Okay that's it. Rather monstrous gaps, I must say, but um, a fully cleaned up OD. Having remachined the OD, I have of course lost those original break edges that I had done on these outside corners. Uh, so I'm just going around the um, outside edges with a stone and a bit of oil, just breaking the edges. With a flat needle file I am now just rounding off the inside corner such that when I put it on the piston it does not scratch the piston's OD. Well judgment is upon us and I'm going to reinstall the new improved piston rings back in. Now the uh, first thing to note is the ease with which it goes into the bore. I'm no piston ring expert but that seems a lot more like it so uh, I'll get this squared up and offer it up to the light. Piston ring in the bore and I will turn this round and carry out an examination of the light gaps. Well as you can see the ring gap is bigger and that is of course not filed. Just trying to stop the telescope effect here but basically if I offer that all the way around There are no light gaps around the OD, so that is highly satisfactory. I am washing my parts in paraffin, just because it's a nice light substance that washes all the bits away without making anything go rusty. Now the benefit of using paraffin is of course that when I'm finished it can go back in the table lamp that it came out of, and as uh, cleaning fluids go it's one of the nicer smelling ones.
It is time for piston rings on and I have the piston held in a collet block. Number one, I think I'm actually going to approach this one from the other end. Looks okay from here. Well, did I break one? No, of course I didn't break one. I've still got a spare. Back to the bench. On this occasion final inspection was satisfactory and so for my own entertainment I'm going to fit the piston with its rings into the cylinder. Now I made this sleeve earlier and its manufacture was not totally in vain because as I mentioned I put this lead in angle on there and this is going to act as an assembly guide so I'm going to offer that up over the cylinder and then encourage the ring into the guide taper Ring one and ring two. And there is one piston in the ball. It even sounds nice. Well that got a bit involved didn't it? Now as they say, all's well that ends well, I'm satisfied with the result and it's going to allow me to call that finished and move on. I'm sure somebody will write to me and say, Mr Crispin, what you have done has seriously compromised the structural integrity of these components and you should do this, this and this. Well, I'm not ruling out a Piston Rings 3, so by all means comment if you have something more to say. Uh, but for now, I am drawing a line under it. I'm going to finish up just with a few little design points. And um, the point in question, the roundness element. So here's what I did. I started with this Piston Ring as machined, I broke it and I stretched it on a mandrel. Now in my mind there were two options when it came to stretching it. Either you stick something in the gap or, as I chose to do, you stretch it over a round mandrel. Now sticking something in the gap uh, appears to be the common way of doing it and this is something I thought up. And why did I think that up? Well, I did a bit of an experiment with sticking something in the gap and I found that as soon as you open this up and stick something in there, you massively disturb the roundness of the ring. When, however, you push it onto a round mandrel, the ring maintains its circularity to a much finer degree. So I thought I was onto something there. Uh, however, as you are now aware, that didn't quite work out. Well, luckily the working of Trimble confirms uh, and illustrates why that happened. And uh, hopefully when you get a chance to read this, you can study this section. But basically he goes into a lot of detail about the forces and the material properties encountered when stretching a ring. And to try and summarise it, what he's basically saying is that when deciding how to stretch this ring, you should actually consider the ring in its stretch position and how that stretched ring then compresses into a ball. Once you've worked out how the stresses affect the material when compressing it, you then reverse the scenario and you stretch it by mirroring those forces. So in other words, you have compressed this and stressed it 
in such a way so you reverse the stressing and use that method to stretch it. Now uh, you need more qualifications and I've got to put that into uh, context but basically as he lays out here what he describes is that the proper stretching method should be done with those two little arrows as you can see perpendicular to the faces of the brake or in his case the slit so um, you can see there there's all kinds of see those little arrows there he goes into details about all the mechanical properties so it is really worth reading and uh, this by the way was published in Strictly IC which is an internal combustion magazine if someone can tell me about the copyright as I mentioned I'm sure we can find some way that the viewers can read this because it's well worth reading a few other little interesting points uh, one about the width now a few people commented saying they'd never seen a piston ring that wide it's not all that unusual to have a piston ring this wide on a steam engine obviously for an internal combustion engine that is a lot wider than the the common uh, piston ring you may find but what Trimble describes when it comes to width is that it's actually very forgiving as you make a piston ring wider the main consideration is that you get more friction and therefore the piston ring gets hotter as it's running in terms of all the other elements of the calculations he says there's not much to it all you get is more friction the wider you make it they don't wear any quicker because yes there's more metal in contact but then the pressure is spread out over more area and so uh, on conversely although you've got more metal in contact and it's getting hotter there is a greater depth of surface that the gases have to pass through if they're going to escape so there wasn't a lot to say on the width um, and I'm going to leave it at that but I'm going to finish with a little story and this is a piston ring story it came to me from my engineering friend and steam locomotion mentor Richard Gibbon and when Richard was chief engineer of the National Railway Museum in York he had a bit of a piston ring situation there's a live steam locomotive there called the Duchess a full size one and it runs up and down the track giving rides and uh, you know general days out for people willing to uh, pay and basically this locomotive had been running for 70 to 80 years it was a little overdue a service perhaps and what had happened over those 70 to 80 years is as follows as the piston had been going up and down the bore the bottom of the piston had worn due to gravity and the whole piston had started to sag equally the piston ring happened to be positioned with the gap at 12 o'clock and with the natural springing of the piston ring as it was going up and down the bore these sections around the gap started to get thinner and thinner any guesses as to what might happen well the piston's gone down the tops of the ring have come up and got thinner and thinner and one day those two things balanced out to the point where the edges of the ring escaped yet the ring had worn down to a thickness of just over two millimeters it had popped up over the top of the piston on a forward stroke and jarred in the ball so you've got your piston the end of the piston ring and the cylinder in a jam and the whole thing was a, a bit of a disaster well there we are, I normally say I hope these things made sense, well uh, on this occasion it's me that needs to make sense of them, not anyone else. I did say in my first video though that it was a bit of an experiment and my method shouldn't be copied, only used as food for thought, and uh, that is very much the case. Don't take the information in these videos as any more serious than any other piece of unreliable information, but if you are going to make a piston ring then what I suggest you do is watch that first video, consider what you've seen in this video, read the works of Trimble and uh, do some Googling and then come up with your own method for however you want to do it based on all those bits of information. I certainly don't suggest you copy me. Now in case you did copy me in the first video, well at least I've done another video showing you how to fix what you've made. So uh, with that we'll call it quits. I hope you've enjoyed watching and see you on the next video.